Well, Mrs. Stevenson, as I say, we discussed all these things in my office ten days ago, your husband and I. I asked Mr. Stevenson how long this heart attack of yours lasted. Oh, she got well right away, Doctor. Maybe I... Maybe I should have pulled out then and there. But I didn't pull out. Somehow I couldn't. Her father wasn't altogether wrong. I hadn't done too badly for myself. Anyway, from that time on, I began to compromise. Always with the hope that somehow, someday, I'd win out on my own. But it wasn't long before we were right back where we started. Another attack? Yes, sir. I remember one day in particular. I had an idea that I thought, that I hoped might help the city. Henry, you mean you brought me here just to look at an apartment? Oh, you'd be crazy about it, Leona. Now, come on, let's go in and look at it. I'm not interested, Henry. But you haven't even seen it. Why, there are terraces on all four sides. I've told room... you a thousand times we don't need an apartment. Leona. Leona, it's not an apartment I'm looking for. What I want is a home. A home of our own. You just can't go on living with your father indefinitely. I don't see why not. There's plenty of room and I like it. Besides, who's going to pay for this little penthouse? Well, I hope eventually I will. Oh, eventually. But in the meantime, it's my money and I'm the one who's going to pay for it. Okay, Leona. Let's go. Oh. Henry, you're so naive. You're like a little boy with a box of candy. I just can't throw my money away on everything you happen to see. There's a limit. Sure, there's a limit. I'm supposed to follow you around like a pet dog tied to a chain. I'm supposed to like whatever crumbs you want to throw. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Yes, you've got me sewed up 16 different ways for three meals a day and pocket money. That's all you care about. That's all you married me for, my money. I should have known it. I should have known it. Oh, stop it, Leona. Please, just for once, will you listen to me? You hate me. You're bored with me. All you want to do is get away. Okay, I'm bored. Bored stiff. Who wouldn't be with that neat little routine you've got cooked up for me? What do I have? Nothing. Nothing on my own. Not even the studs on my shirt or the matches in my pocket. Henry, Henry, how can you say this to me? You once told me I'd love this kind of life, remember? Well, do you want to know something? I do love it. I love it now more than you'll ever know. But I want to be my own boss, profiting by every bit of it. Not just the stooge on the outside looking in. Henry! Henry, get me some water. Quick. Listen to me, Leona. Please. It isn't that I want to be without you. I could love you still if only you'd try to understand. Henry, my purse. Henry, the the pills. And my purse. That attack kept her in the hospital nearly three weeks, Doctor. At the time, I... Well, I thought it was all my fault. But no matter what I did, her attacks increased in violence and became more frequent. About a year ago, Leona... Well, she, she just seemed to give up hope of ever getting well. She took to her bed, more or less permanently. It was my idea to come to New York and see you. The doctors in Chicago said she didn't have much of a chance. Anyway, we rented the house on Sutton Place, and here we are. And believe me, it's been more and more like a nightmare. Mr. Stevenson, there's absolutely nothing wrong organically with your wife's heart. Nothing wrong? I've examined her thoroughly. And what you've just told me confirms what I've thought from the start. And, and that is? Her condition is mostly mental. Mental? She's what we call a cardiac neurotic. Her attacks are brought on by her emotions, her lack of control, her frustrations. The whole thing is probably quite unconscious on her part. Now, I'm not saying your wife isn't sick. Mentally, she is sick, and her attacks are real enough. But, given the proper treatment, she may snap out of it entirely. Well, I'll... I'll call on her tomorrow. There's a psychiatrist I wanted to see. Doctor, uh, I wish you could wait a few days. I'd like to think this over. Think it over? Yes, you see, she's so easily upset. And I think that, well, that maybe I ought to prepare her. You know, get her used to the idea. Well, a few days more or less won't matter, I suppose. Unless... Unless you wanted to write her a letter. It might make it easier for her to take, and it... Well, it would give me more time to talk to her. Well, it's an extremely delicate matter, Mr. Stevenson. I... But if you think you can manage it, let's try it that way. Give me a ring in a couple of days. Meanwhile, I'll write the letter. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks for everything. Well, that's exactly the way I left things, Mrs. Stevenson, ten days ago. As your husband requested, I wrote you the letter. And I'm telling you I never received a letter. Well, let's not worry about that now. I've told you everything, and now I want you to relax. Do you have that sedative I prescribed? Yes, yes, it's here. Well, then take some. Double the dose, and I'll... Liars! 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 Hello. Mrs. Stevenson? Who is it? This is Mr. Evans. 
I've been trying to get you, but your line has been busy. Has Mr. Stevenson come home? No, no, he isn't here. He won't be back until Sunday. And will you please, please tell me what this is all about? Why are you calling him? Who are you? I've already told you, Mrs. Stevenson, and I'm very sorry if I've annoyed you. But there are names and addresses that are very important for Mr. Stevenson to know. So if you'll be good enough to take the following message... What are you talking about? I can't take any messages now. If you'll please tell Mr. Stevenson that the house at 20 Dunstan Terrace has been burned down. I burned it down. You... you what? Also, that I do not believe it was Mr. Morano, the name is spelled M-O-R-A-N-O, who betrayed us to the police. And since Mr. Morano has been arrested by the district attorney's office, there is no necessity for the money now. Oh, oh this is fantastic. What money? Who's Morano? Thirdly, tell Mr. Stevenson that I escaped, and I am now at the Manhattan address. However, I do not expect to be here after midnight. If he wishes to find me, he may call me at a phone number, Bowie 21000. And now, if you'll be so good as to repeat... Oh, message, you're insane. Do you realize I'm a terribly sick woman? I'm very sorry for you, Mrs. Stevenson. I don't know. Perhaps it would be better to tell you the true facts. I mean now, before they are garbled by the police. Maybe then you'll understand. But if you're ill... I don't know what or whom to believe. So much has happened to me tonight. And I'm sick. My doctor says I'm... I'll tell you all I know, Mrs. Stevenson. Well, tell me then. Tell me. It started over a little... A year ago. At your father's factory in Chicago. You see, Mrs. Stevenson, I had worked in your father's company for many years. I'm a chemist. Anyway, late one afternoon, your husband walked into the laboratory and he... We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of Sorry, Wrong Number. Our guest tonight is Barbara Ann Newtson, young Par- Paramount starlet. Aren't you glad, Barbara, you were present at a certain little theater production one evening? A lucky evening for me, Mr. Keeley. A talent scout saw me, arranged for a screen test, and... and here you are in picture. Yes. And from now on, I'm going to work like mad. Oh, it must be wonderful to be a great actress like... like Olivia de Havilland. Well, I gather you've seen her new picture, The Heiress. Not once, but three times. I can understand why the New York motion picture critics gave Mr. Havlin the award for the best performance of the year. And how did you like Montgomery Clift as the money-conscious suitor in the heiress? He's splendid, so dashing and, and romantic, too. And Ralph Richardson as a stern father is simply perfect. Do you remember the scene where he compares his unpopular daughter with her sought-after cousin? Oh, yes. The party scene where Mona Freeman is the reigning belle. She's like a Dresden doll, so blonde and dainty. Those lavish costumes of the crinoline era suit her beauty very well. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And she's just as delicate and lovely in real life. Always so beautifully groomed. Real lux loveliness, huh? Exactly. Mona Freeman gives her complexion daily lux soap care. And she's really keen about the new bath size cake. Nine out of ten screen stars say they're delighted with this new product of Lever Brothers Company. For a luxurious, refreshing, relaxing beauty bath... You simply can't buy a finer soap. That's the way I feel. I love the nice fragrance that leaves on the skin. Thank you, Miss Barbara Ann Knudsen. Women who use the generous new bath size Lux Toilet Soap will agree. Its rich, abundant lather and delicate flower-like fragrance make a wonderfully refreshing beauty bath. So, for all over Lux loveliness, why not get the satin smooth bath size Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? Here's our producer. Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Bert Lancaster as Henry. I get in through the kitchen window. I wait till the train goes over the bridge. 11.15. I've got it all straight now. 11.15. The 
clock on the table says ten minutes to eleven o'clock. But Leona Stevenson, clutching the telephone, listens with mounting bewilderment and fright to the voice of a man named Waldo Evans. Yes, Mrs. Stevenson. Your husband came into the laboratory and started asking me questions about the drugs we use and how we prepare them. Well, this is very interesting, Mr. Evans. So, uh, this is where the formula for all our products are developed, huh? That's right. Some of these drugs must be very valuable. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevenson, very valuable. I see. And, uh, tell me, uh, what do you do with them? Well, they go into the various Cotterell products, sir. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you're the man in charge here, huh? Yes, sir. I see. Well, thanks for your time, Mr. Evans. I was just curious. Thank you, sir. Good night, Mr. Stevenson. That was my first meeting with your husband, Mrs. Stevenson. Then, from time to time, he'd drop into the laboratory and visit with me. And one night, when it was storming, he offered to drive me home. So you're a bachelor, Mr. Evans. Well, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. I live in a rooming house on uh, Chestnut Street. A man all by himself, no responsibilities. Tell me, why do you work so hard? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, because, because I have a hope. An ideal, you might say. In a few years, I, I hope to retire. Retire, huh? Oh, I have it all planned, sir. I'm going back to England. I hope to raise horses, sir. Well, not, uh, not raise horses. Just horses, sir. Do you care for horses, Mr. Stevenson? Well, I'm afraid I haven't thought very much about them. Oh, then you're missing a great deal. Well, that's my hope, sir. To live there quietly and raise horses. Why have you waited this long? Money? Money, of course. But someday I'll... Well, why wait until you're old? What good is a dream when you're too old to enjoy it? Oh, I've thought of that, Mr. Stevenson. I suppose the zest does come out of things with the encroachments of old age. Now you're talking, Wally. My motto is if you want something, get it now. It's, uh... It's the next turn to the right, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Chestnut Street. You know, Wally... Wally, I've been thinking. There might be a way out. A way out? Yes. To have your little place in England. Everything you want. <laughs> Indeed, sir. And all you have to do is to make a little mistake every now and then. Mistake? In the laboratory. I've been checking on it, Wally. The way you're set up, no one would ever know. Mr. Stevenson, I... <laughs> I'd better say good night, sir. Wait a minute. The differences in the amounts of those raw drugs you handle need be so slight that nobody but yourself would ever know. I... I don't understand, sir. Look what you've done for the company all these years. And what have you gotten out of it? Not a tenth of the salary you should be getting. No. No, please, Mr. Stevenson. Now, don't be silly. I've already talked it over with someone else. Talked it over with... With whom? A man named Murano. He can handle all the raw drugs that we can get. And then we split. You, Murano, and I. Mr. Stevenson, I just can't believe it. You're a young man. Vice President of the company. A wonderful future ahead of you. Don't make me laugh. Yes, I'm young. Young enough not to waste my life in dreaming. There are things I want to do, big things, and the only way to do them... I'm sorry, Wally. I thought you were my kind of a person. I trusted you. I... But, but what if we were caught? Why should we be caught? We'll make our pile and stop before anyone even guesses what went on. Morano knows just what to do. Besides, for once, there's an advantage in being Cotterell's son-in-law. Yes. Yes, I... I see. I thought you would, Wally. Well, partner, we're in business. Mm -hmm.